Can I say a big welcome and uh, thank you for joining today's webinar. And we're delighted to report that over 75 people have registered for today's event. Uh, my name is Sean Kinghorn. I'm a trustee with Thrombosis UK and someone who has a history of recovering from pulmonary embolism. Um, I'm delighted to chair this third patient webinar organized by George Jerome and the Thrombosis UK team in support of World, World Thrombosis Day. And as you've gathered from the registration details, the main focus of today's webinar is understanding and managing pain caused by blood clots. And we know that blood clots often cause considerable pain, which can be long lasting or chronic. And understand the possible causes can help us address the options and improve our uh, health and well-being. In this live webinar, we welcome three specialists from across the fields of physiotherapy, vascular care and psychology, who will share and discuss the causes, challenges and possible therapeutic options to reduce ongoing pain. Um, in terms of the format of the session today, each speaker will offer a presentation and after each speaker, there will be two to three minutes where we'll uh, share some questions and discuss some points that you've raised either in the chat or in the questions or answers or questions that have been submitted prior to the webinar. The session is uh, due to close around 11 o'clock, but we may span that out about uh, 10 past 11 for those of you who can stay with us. This session will be recorded and the aim is to make the recording available to view later. And you can add your questions, as I mentioned before, in the uh, Q&A or chat at the bottom of this Zoom page. We'll try our best to get through as many questions as possible, but please be assured that any questions or comments you make in the chat or question and answer section is anonymous. So at no point during today's session uh, will your identity be, be compromised. I'm delighted to introduce our first speaker, uh, Mr. Stephen Black, who will set the scene for this session. And in terms of background, uh, Stephen qualified at the University of Withenstand. I hope I've pronounced that correctly, Stephen, before moving into the UK in 2001. In 2010, he was appointed as a consultant vascular surgeon and honorary senior lecturer at St. George's Hospital and Medical School. At St. George's, Mr. Black led the establishment of a programme for deep venous intervention which has grown to be one of the largest in Europe. In 2014, Stephen became a consultant vascular surgeon at Guy's and St. Thomas's Hospital. He's a globally respected authority on deep venous uh, intervention and his work has brought relief to many patients struggling with pain caused by uh, blood, blood clots. So thank you, Stephen. It's over to you. Um, Stephen will offer an overview uh, some important principles need to consult first, and then I'll pose a few questions for, for Stephen. So over to you there, Stephen. Uh, thank you very much. Let me uh, just share my screen here. Um, so thank you very much for that kind introduction. Uh, yes, bit vatas rant is a difficult word for anybody to pronounce coming from uh, outside of South Africa, I guess, but uh, I can't pronounce anything in Welsh or Gaelic, so I probably share the same issues. Um, so this is just a short introduction and really the, the, the question I was asked to address is what is blood clot? Uh, and actually, it, it, you know, getting the terminology right does really help in understanding what we need to do and also understand what, uh, what patients should, should be asking and how they should be addressing some of the issues that come up. So there's a, a, key, a, key, a key difference between clot and thrombus. And actually clot is a word that gets used a lot because everybody remembers it, but it is it is, it is not really a term that, that describes what is going on in the body or what is happening to patients. So there's two key things that happen. One is that when you first get a clot, in inverted commas, in your vessel, what it really is, is thrombus that forms. Clot is something that forms in test tubes that we look at in the lab or forms in uh, bodies after they died, where there is a process of, um, of blood sticking together. But the main difference is that that clot doesn't stick to the vessel wall. And there is no sort of process of trying to break it up going on that is a physiological process. And that, that's a really key thing because that's really where all the treatments are that we, we aim at. And the other thing to be 
key on is what the concept of chronic clot is. And a lot of people will go for scans on their leg after they've had a DVT or they'll get seen by somebody and they'll say, there's still, is there still clot there and you're worrying about it? This is what chronic clot looks like in a vessel that's opened up. And you can see it's really thick, white, dense stuff. In fact, what it is, is scar tissue. So if you imagine that you cut your arm, you get a little, some bleeding that forms a scab. And then over time you get a scar. That's really what's happened to the blood inside your bloodstream that has formed a, a thrombus. The thrombus has then either been resorbed by the body or is stuck around. And if it sticks around, it turns into scar tissue over time. So a lot of the issues we get with patients who think they've had a recurrent DVT or having recurrent problems are because they've got scar tissue that is in their veins and you get very similar symptoms to early DVT and you rush in for a scan and you get scanned again and you, you, somebody tells you you've got chronic clot and that leads people to worrying that that clot will break off and go to their, go to their heart or their lungs or whatever it is going to move. What you can see from this picture is this stuff is like concrete. It isn't going anywhere. So after about two or three weeks, uh, when you've had that thrombus form in your vessel, it's not going to move. So really, we need to get away from using the term clot because it isn't actually accurate. But you know, it's like everything else; it's 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 stuck in 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 our minds to some extent. We have to remember on Virco's birthday, which is World Thrombosis Day, that Virco described the original triad for why you might get blood clot or thrombus forming in your vessels, and Virco's triad of thrombosis really talks about vessel wall injury, which are damage to the vessels, hypercoagulability of blood, which is things like cancer and blood clotting disorders, thrombophilias, inflammatory disease, and so on, and, and flow-related uh, problems, which cause blood to stop moving. So when you are, are thinking about why you might get recurrent DVT or recurrent blood clots, even when you're on a blood thinner, it's really this aspect here, stasis of blood. And actually, stasis of blood is the biggest problem we face in treating patients because if you don't have good pipes coming into the area that we're trying to fix with stents, for example, and I'll get into that later, it's really difficult to overcome that. So if you remember, these are the three causes. Each of those are going to do something different. And stasis is why we try and encourage patients to move, get back to exercise, do the things that they need to do. Uh, thrombophilia is where the, the anticoagulants are focused, the cancer, inflammatory disease, to try and overcome that. And surgery and vessel wall irritation are probably the things we see the least, but it's, it's why you might get a blood clot after cancer treatment, for example, or radiotherapy. It's also important to understand the difference between superficial veins and deep veins. I mean, oftentimes we treat people with superficial veins for varicose veins, for example, uh, and uh, we might be um, told that uh, uh, somebody will say to me, well, how does the blood flow get back to my heart? Well, what you've got to think of is a network of roads taking you back to the main city. And the superficial veins are like the B roads or A roads that are taking in the byways. And the, and the deep veins are the main motorway. So obviously, if you have a free-flowing motorway, there's no traffic buildup. But for example, if you have an accident, which is uh, like a DVT, you're going to get big buildup of traffic on that motorway very fast. And that's why you get um, pressure building up in your leg. If you get a blood clot or you have scar tissue, which has reduced the motorway to two lanes out of five, for example, rather than having a big uh, free-flowing road. And of course, the most feared consequence of all of this is post-thrombotic syndrome. And it's, and it's these things that start to lead to problems with pain. Uh, and one of the things about venous pain is that it's very, very difficult to understand how it all hangs together because the venous system is incredibly complex and really difficult to understand how collaterals work and uh, where alternative pathways open up and what the consequence, some people have big ulcers like this that aren't painful. Other people have a tiny little ulcer that is really painful. So pain in itself is a very complex thing that isn't always tied to what uh, uh, legs might look like. So what should we do about thrombosis? And, and this is really the main thrust of today's talk is first of all, you have to prevent it from happening. The, bigger, the best strategy is don't get a blood clot in the first place and take care of avoiding it. If it does happen, then we need to treat it. And we'll talk more of that later on, what our options for treating it are. And we have to try and prevent the post-thrombotic syndrome developing, which is the main consequence that we, we worry about. And post-thrombotic syndrome actually applies both to the leg and to the lungs. There is a much more recognized uh, long-term damage from, from pulmonary embolism. And we have to start to get the message out that there are options to deal with complications. For too long, messaging around the venous system was, there's nothing you can do. You just have to live with it, which isn't, which isn't true. There are options for a lot more people nowadays. We've made a big inroads into understanding this better and getting better results. 
we don't always win, we're not always successful, but I think we, we, we're starting to get much better at that. So with that, I'll hand back to uh, Sean and uh, we can uh, go to some questions. Thanks very much indeed uh, for that really uh, helpful presentation, Stephen, to set the steam. Um, I've just got two questions uh, and I appreciate um, that you'll be talk probably expanding this later, but could you give us an indication at what point you would suggest a referral to a vascular surgeon is indicated? Um, uh, it's, it, that's a, a great question, Sean, and it depends on where you're at. If, if you presented and you have a sudden onset of a DVT, which is fresh, and it's extensive and involving your whole leg, then, then you know, my feeling now is that we should be getting those patients to be assessed and offered the option of, of clot busting therapy or, 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 or techniques to remove the blood clot because our long-term results are so much better if we get the veins back to largely normal at the start before there's damage, before that chronic scar tissue is formed, which makes causes a problem. Okay. Then really for anybody else, if you've got disabling symptoms that are affecting your quality of life or stopping you from doing the things you need to do, or you're in pain, or your leg is swollen all the time, or you can't walk and exercise, or you're getting leg ulcers, then I think all those patients should be sent for, for, for a referral. And at the moment, we're doing a lot of lobbying at a government level. We had a discussion with the all-party parliamentary group just last week uh, to talk about the inequalities in referral practice for patients who are suffering from damage to their deep venous system uh, and improving those pathways for patients. But most of that will come from patients themselves lobbying for a referral. So don't, you know, just don't take no for an answer. There are options. You just need to, to, to get to somebody who's going to give them to you. Okay, thank you. That's, that's just really helpful. I think secondly, and I, I think it's something that um, quite interesting, when I had my pulmonary embolism, I had no pain in the leg at all. But four months beforehand, I had what I thought was a calf strain. And I guess one of the things that I've noticed, uh, you know, I guess networking with other patients who've had uh, thrombotic events is that how can you spot the difference between simple things like muscle strain in the calf or pain that is likely to be sourced by an underlying DVT? And I know it's not an easy question to answer, but I guess in, in our minds, getting a sense of is DVT pain any different to a muscle strain or? Well, you know, that's a great question again, and, and it's one of the, the challenges we face, you know, so when you look at the difference between arterial problems and venous problems that we face as vascular surgeons, effectively, we glorified plumbers with slightly less, uh, uh, you know, um, involvement in, in, in a general skill set, is the arteries are connected to a pump that takes blood to your to your body and and that's very easy to understand and if you block an artery it's very clear to anybody it's a bit like having a heart attack or a stroke or problem in your leg it's obvious there's no doubt everybody knows what when you block veins because your body responds in a different way sometimes it can be quite hard to detect so for example i had um, one of uh, my patients who now interesting is doing a phd research project with us in treating venous patients uh, she came to me because she couldn't run properly and it had taken ages for a diagnosis to be made. And she had really scarred up veins, but clearly she had had a previous DVT, but she couldn't even remember having it. But when I treated her, the back pain she got from a stent going in, and most people who have a stent get a bit of back pain, reminded her of a pain event she'd had when she was 18 that suggested that that was probably the original triggering blood clot that had just caused her lower back pain that had resolved over a course of two or three weeks. Mm -hmm. So sometimes if your leg doesn't swell, it can be really difficult to know if you're having a DVT or not. And certainly we can't have everybody who has a muscle strain running to their GP for a scan because that would overwhelm the service. So it is quite difficult, but you, you have to um, kind of uh, put those, those pieces together. If you've got unusual pain that isn't going away and you haven't really had a clear event that would have caused a muscle strain or a muscle injury, then you should think to yourself, this is not just a muscle strain. You know, so normally, if you're going to tear a calf muscle, you've done something pretty adventurous to do it. Yeah. You, you've done something vigorous. If it just has come on and you go to your GP and, and they go, well, this must be a muscle strain and you've done nothing, then have a high index of suspicion. You know? And then uh, I'm sure Rigitza will be able to add, add something to that because from the physio point of view, this is we see patients who come from physios going, this is not a muscle strain. You know? And there are some subtle differences, but it's quite hard. And that's the challenge we face with DVT is, that, that, that instant message is just not there all the time. Yeah. 
Thank you. Thanks very much indeed, Stephen. And that leads us nicely into our second presentation uh, from uh, Rigitze Lewis. And um, you get a sense from Stephen's remarks already that this is very much a team effort in terms of managing pain um, linked to, to clots. Uh, and by way of introduction, it's first of all a pleasure to welcome uh, Rigitze Lewis, who's a specialist physiotherapist with a career working in primary, secondary and tertiary care. And she has special, specialized knowledge and experience in long-term condition management and delivered rehabilitation programs from a variety of, to a variety of conditions, including cardiac, pulmonary and musculoskeletal. She's now based at the Bath Royal United Hospital and Rajitsi is a co-lead in a pilot study to assess the value of a rehabilitation program for patients diagnosed with a PE or DVT. So it's my pleasure now to hand over to Rigidsi. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Sean. I'm just going to share my screen here. Uh, there we are. So um, I'm going to be talking about how to uh, recover from or, or how to, uh, yes, how to get over venous thromboembolism. And that term is something that covers both uh, pulmonary embolism and uh, a deep vein thrombosis. Oh, let's see. Right. So uh, really importantly, we're going to talk about deconditioning first because it's very important to understand that when we've had some kind of um, medical incident, say, um, condition, deconditioning is something that can happen to us all. So this could be if you had the flu, this could be if you had sprained an ankle, or this could be if you had um, a venous thromboembolism. So what happens, we've got uh, Garfield there looking quite relaxed. So let's say he sprained his paw and he takes it easy for two weeks because he's not feeling very well. Now, he's going to have a whole load of consequences if he does less than he's used to. So he'll have muscle weakness, stiffness, he'll lose some fitness, he might put on weight, there'll be psychological consequences. And so it's very reasonable to expect he will be in more pain and he will be more short of breath as a consequence of the deconditioning, not just what happened to his poor originally. So um, we talk about deconditioning as a vicious cycle. And again, just to stress, this happens to us all um, for different reasons uh, at any point. So if you have a um, symptom of fatigue, it could be pain, shortness of breath, it is quite uh, natural to do less. You, you want the symptom to go away, so you do less. And that leads to deconditioning which then leads to an increase in symptoms, which leads you to do less, more deconditioning, and so that cycle goes round. But we can stop that cycle at any point, and that's really key, and we can turn that around. So if we focus for a minute on breathlessness, it's um, important to understand that breathlessness is subjective. Um, so you can't tell how breathless somebody is by looking at them. Uh, they will have their own sense of how breathless they are. And breathlessness is normal during, during exertion. So if you've had a PE and you have experienced that perhaps sudden onset of shortness of breath, it doesn't go away, it doesn't matter what you do. If you relax, it doesn't go away. That is, that is not a normal uh, shortness of breath, and that can be very disconcerting later on then when you are recovering and you are getting short of breath. Um, but we want to emphasize that shortness of breath during exertion is normal. And if you're then deconditioned as well, you will get more short of breath. Um, but normally shortness of breath just should settle after you've uh, exerted yourself. So if you're walking up a hill and getting short of breath, that's normal. 
Um, but when you stop then and have a break, that shortness of breath should settle. And the breathlessness again should decrease as fitness improves. And we are advising people who are recovering from a VTE to undertake moderate intensity activity. And I will come on to that in a little bit what that is. So um, the Department of Health guidelines for adults apply to us all, um, including people who are recovering from a VTE. Um, but think of them as a goal rather than as a starting point. So we should all be aiming to be active for at least 150 minutes a week of moderate intensity activity, but you can break that up into smaller chunks. Um, and we should also be looking at building strength. It doesn't have to be uh, in a gym with dumbbells. It could be uh, something you're doing day to day in your garden or uh, carrying shopping. Um, and we should look at improving balance as well. So uh, at the Royal United Hospitals here in Bath, we've done a VTE um, recovery program, so an exercise program, and we had components of all of these things, so cardiovascular exercises that got your heart rate up, got your short of breath. We've done strengthening and also some balance work. So that's a really nice mixture to have. And whatever you do, whatever you can manage, just think about breaking up those periods of sitting down for long periods of time. So we talked about intensity of activity and moderate intensity. That is what we advise if you're trying to get back into things after a VTE, if you're getting back to your usual activities. And it's really important to understand that once you've started on your anticoagulants, you can get moving and you, you should get moving. We advise that. Um, moderate intensity activity is what we are advising, not because it would be risky or dangerous to do anything more vigorous, but just for, because for the majority of people, that is the most um, pleasant, if you, if you like. So moderate intensity, again, is different for us all, but it would be something where you could talk in sentences while you're moving. Uh, you might not be able to sing a song, but um, you would feel warmer. You're definitely, uh, you're definitely doing something. You're breathing faster um, and your heart rate is going up. So at this moment in time, and I think this is this is um, this has been the issue with with VTE rehabilitation. Um, it's, it can be difficult to access support. I would say um, Thrombosis UK have done excellent work and have produced a leaflet, which is also uh, which is called Getting Active, um, and that is on the website. But there are also lots and lots of physical activity resources available to you. And if I, if I had to choose just one from the selection here, I would say if you go on to the We Are Undefeatable website, you will see a whole host of um, options to choose from. And you can put in what, what condition you have. So you could put in that you've had uh, a venous thromboembolism uh, and, and have something that's, uh, that, that's tailored to your level. Um, there are also um, exercise on prescription schemes going on. Um, and it's just with COVID, I don't know, some of them are not perhaps running as they have been um, before, but, but there are lots of opportunities. There are pedometers that you can access on your smartphone or you may have a, a, a sort of mechanical pedometer where you can measure your steps and then gradually increase there are um there are apps where you do sort of bursts of 10 minutes of activities um you may want to uh take it up and 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 work towards doing uh five kilometers lots of different things uh, according to what you what you're interested in um, one of the participants, and this is um, 
quite a representative quote from the rehabilitation service we have run here at the Royal United Hospitals. Um, shows uh, really the anxiety um, that is associated with getting active again after a, a VTE. So uh, this, this uh, lady was saying, I was terrified to exercise again. I knew it would help me recover, but I didn't know what was safe and how far I should push myself. The physiotherapy team are helping me to recognize what pain or breathlessness is normal and what are warning signs to look out for. I'm starting to feel safe and confident to get active again. So this is a gradual process of getting to know your body, what is normal for me, what is um, normal breathlessness for me, what is normal muscle soreness or stiffness that I could expect because I've just been exercising a bit, I've been doing more that I'm used to. Um, so it's a process of getting to know your body and your symptoms, if you like. So the messages I'd like to leave you with is that um, exercise and physical activity is safe and beneficial. In fact, we would be more worried if you didn't move. That is riskier, not moving is riskier. We definitely recommend a gradual return to activity. So um, we're looking at increasing your level of activity by 10 to 20% a week. Now that means if you've just, if you've had a VTE and you think, well, I used to play football three times a week, but in the last two weeks I have been sitting down mainly, then your starting point is the sitting down, is the recent activity in the past two weeks. So uh, we then go from there to gradually increase by 10 to 20% a week. And that could be, so as an example, if I'm able to walk for 10 minutes now, then next week I'm not looking to suddenly double or treble it. I'm looking to add 10 to 20%. So maybe I'll be walking for 12, um, for 12 minutes. So um, the next point is the shortness of breath during exertion is normal. And delayed onset muscle soreness is normal. So if you've exerted yourself, you will get short of breath. And if you've done more than normal, you will probably also get some sore muscles. Um, and we are encouraging you to do little and often. If you're doing sort of um, marathon-like bursts, you will probably get more sore. But if you do little and often, which is also what we call uh, pacing yourself, then you're more likely to have an easier recovery. And above all, whatever you decide to do, it's really important that you enjoy it because if you enjoy it, you're more, more likely to stick with it. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed. Excellent presentation, as you see. Um, I guess we've had one comment which ties up nicely with the tail end of your presentation. Um, and it's it's a quite a common question. It says, I often get leg pain after DVTs and try to stay active and do lots of cycling. And sometimes I'm not sure whether to exercise so the pain or is it better to rest? And I get a sense from your presentation, it's about uh, being sensible and graduated in your approach, but it's also about learning to listen to your body, I'm, I'm, I'm sensing. Absolutely. And I think if we go back to uh, an example like a sprained ankle, if somebody had a sprained ankle and they are getting back into activity, we would expect to see that sprained ankle um, swell in the evenings, perhaps. And this could be for months. This could be for six months. This could be for longer. So it's about getting to know your, your state, if you like. And your, your new state after a, an event like a VT, um, and definitely taking the gradual approach. I would also use the, um, the analogy of, of dipping your toe in the water. When you're trying to see what's, what's right for me, try it out, dip your toe in the water, see what are my symptoms like after this? Have I overdone it? Is this, is this making things worse for me? 
or does it not really matter? Will I feel like this whether I move or not, in which case I'm better off moving because I won't then get the deconditioning and the symptoms from that? Okay, thank you. I guess one question before I move over to Paul's presentation is that um, I guess one of the observations that one can make is that it's the skills of the practitioners such as physiotherapists, vascular surgeons and, and psychologists. Uh, but what can patients do to prepare to make most of the support offered by the physiotherapists uh, in the consultations and treatment? Because it seems to me success might be as a result of that partnership and the patient being prepared to, to be an active partner in that, in that process. Yes, and I think, uh, to be honest, because this is sort of a, in terms of rehabilitation, this is a relatively new area. So there's, there's a bit of um, maybe uh, a fear amongst, well, I don't know if we could call it fear, but uncertainty amongst, um, um, it could be, you know, personal trainers out in the community, it could be uh, healthcare professionals that we don't want to overdo it. We, we don't want to, uh, we got to go gently and, and carefully and, and so on. But really the message is actually the opposite. The message is uh, get active, get moving. Once you're on anticoagulants, so that uh, the clot is not building, the thrombus is not building. Um, really, and, and I think if we spread the word with, with our uh, Thrombosis UK leaflets, and, and, uh, and, and I know that Thromb Thrombosis UK um, are doing a lot of work to raise awareness amongst healthcare professionals as well, so that we can support our patients in the best possible way. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much. It's a uh, look, great presentation. Uh, and uh, exercise can be such a turning point in, in, in that, that uh, recovery journey. So thank you very much indeed. I'd now like to um, introduce our next speaker, Professor Paul Bennett, who looks he's just surrounded by every flag possible. Um, uh, Professor Bennett has worked as a, a clinical psychologist in the NHS, an academic with an interest in how people cope with serious illness uh, for over 20 years. He has been a strong advocate of psychological careful and thrombosis and research carried out by Paul and his team is cited in the development of both the NICE and American Society of Hematology guidelines for the treatment of thrombosis. And Paul is also a fellow trustee of Thrombosis UK and has recently co-authored patient-centered resources for Thrombosis UK on managing the psychological impact of blood clots. And these are available on the Thrombosis UK website. And having met Paul in the past, he's extremely passionate about this aspect of care. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to hand over to Professor Paul Bennett. Marvellous. Thank you very much, Sean. Um, hello, everybody. I'm just going to show, go to share screen and we'll have a look at what I've got to say. Um, OK, here we go. Oh, ah. Sorry about this. This is all supposed to be set up and now it isn't. There we go. Marvellous. What a good start for the session. Eh? OK. Just as a sort of setting, really, I think one of the things about pain is that it is dominant. It is a signal that says, stop, be careful. And the problem is that when that stop, be careful, pay attention message comes through and it's inappropriate, then that can cause a number of problems. It can stop you doing pleasant things, things you want to do and so on and so forth. And part of the decisions we've already been talking about by both uh, Stephen and Rigitza is this notion of how do you know when a pain is um, a symptom of something problematic or when it is something that you can sort of work through. So the, the, the beginning of my talk is called pain may be a sign of problems, but it may not. So I'm going to show you my most complicated slide now. I, I, I knew I'd have medics and physios showing complicated things. So I thought I'd show you this. And part of the question, I, I guess, is what is a psychologist doing um, talking about pain? You know, isn't pain a physical sort of process? And I don't want to go into detail on this. Frankly, I can't go into detail on this. But this is, this is the sort of message that I think 
um, is worth bearing in mind. Okay, so here, if you can see where I'm sort of doing the mouse, you have some sort of injury. Some part of the, of the body has an injury, whether it's a clot, whether it's a cut, whether it's a break or whatever. And the old fashioned theories said that there's a nerve that goes from, or a series of nerves that go from this particular point and they go to the uh, spine and then they send messages up to the brain that say pain, 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 which is true, it does happen. But one of the really interesting things is, much as there is this, this process of sending pain messages up to the brain, the brain actually sends messages down to the spinal cord and actually can influence literally the, the degree of pain that people experience. There are chemicals going into that spinal cord that are mediating the influence of uh, the, the feeling of pain, one of which is gloriously called substance P. I mean, it sounds dark and deadly, and it's, um, but there's other things going on as well. So there, there, much as there is this flow of information to the brain saying pain, there is also information coming down to the spinal cord that actually influences uh, the experience of pain. And people have called that the gate, the gate theory. There is the idea that um, some psychological processes will increase the positive things coming down here and reduce um, the experience of pain. Um, some uh, psychological processes will facilitate um, the experience of pain. So it's not to say the pain is um, somehow psychologically made up. We're literally talking about the experience, the degree of pain that, it, that people experience. And people have talked about opening and closing the gate. Things that open the gate um, make pain more um, painful, literally. Things that close the gate are actually reducing the, 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 that sensation of pain. And there's a number of things that we know um, can, can do that sort of thing. So we know, for example, that if you're anxious, that tends to open the gate. We become less tolerant of pain and we experience more pain. If we're depressed, we tend to experience more pain. So there are these acute anxiety during, the, during some sort of, oh, what's going on here? Oh, and if you begin to get anxious, then that can literally increase the experience of pain. If you are anxious in general or depressed uh, more generally, again, that can influence that experience. The attention that we give to the pain can um, influence significantly um, that, that pain experience. I mean, I've had knee surgery and I can make my knees hurt just by thinking of it. Um, it's a good excuse for not doing anything, of course, but oh, no, we shouldn't be doing that. We should be being active. Thank you, Rigitza. So, but just merely thinking of that pain and focusing on that, I can literally e experience some sensations or whatever. Our expectations, you know, if we think that the pain is going to be um, harmful, if we, if we think that the pain is going to increase if we continue to do what we're doing, then those sorts of things both change what we do in response to the pain, but they also literally influence um, the experience of pain. Uh, and Sean's talked about, um, uh, and one of the questions has already been about the, the pain of cycling. It's quite interesting that if you have um, pain during exercise um, and you're a keen exerciser, it's often seen as a positive thing rather than a negative thing. And it, 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 it sort of, um, it, 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 because you have that, oh, this is good, I'm working hard. Actually, the experience is very difficult than if you're thinking, oh my God, what's going on here? Is there some sort of problem? And that sends you down a different route, a different experience. So that those expectations, those beliefs about the nature uh, of the pain can be um, very problematic and very influential. So what can we do? Well, I'm gonna go onto those things on there in a minute. So I shall shut up and move on. Well, I won't shut up. So I've got a couple of scenarios to think about. What can people do? 
um, and what is causing the pain. So this is um, scenario one, which is what is that pain? And it's interesting, we've already spoken about the shortness of breath that goes along uh, following a pulmonary embolism. We've spoken about uh, pain in the calves that may be a function of um, um, doing exercise that may be novel, new, and therefore um, placing a, a sort of um, a strain on the body. So the thing that sets this process off, if you start top left-hand side, is that people experience some sort of physical sensation. It may be pain, it may be shortness of breath, it may be more classified as discomfort. But this then becomes a something that has to be paid attention. Pain, as I say, is something that is very important. So we begin to pay attention to it. If our interpretation is, I'm being harmed, this heralds a problem. You might not say those exact words, but if the nature of the thoughts is along those sorts of um, uh, ways of thinking, then what then happens is you begin to feel anxious. You begin to focus on the pain. You stop doing what you're doing because, hang on a minute, I've got to stop this may be causing me problems. And in, in the worst case scenarios, you may even seek medical help. Now, all of those things, well, certainly feeling anxious and focusing on the pain, if you think about it, are the things that open the gate. So the danger is that you can then get a vicious cycle going on where you feel anxious, you focus on the pain, that makes you more aware of the pain, that leads you to further, oh my goodness me, yeah, this is a problem, and then you get into that vicious cycle. You stop what you're doing, you're more likely to seek medical help, which may on occasion be justified. This is not to say that some pain does not herald real issues. But the danger is that people overreact, people over respond to circumstances that may not be those that require medical help, those that um, um, require some sort of change in behavior and so forth. And the sort of long-term outcome of that is that in a way, if you are being restricted because of the pain that, um, that you're experiencing, then you may not do things you wanna do. You may lose valued outcomes. What a wonderfully trendy word. But it's things that you want to do that you may not be able to do. You may become depressed. You may end up even going to a hospital and going through that whole process only to be told there's nothing wrong. And that's been a very dispiriting experience in itself. So what can we do? I think the critical thing really um, is that when people begin to get these sort of sensations that are either discomfort, pain, et cetera, it's interesting that in particular Rigitza, but to some extent Stephen was saying that, you know, uh, you need, we, need, we all need to think about the context of that pain. Is this a pain that makes sense in terms of what I've been doing before? You know, if I've walked up a flight of stairs quickly, then if I'm feeling short of breath and a bit of a tightness and a bit of a um, even, even discomfort and pain, does this make sense because I've done something that's made me short of breath? If you feel a pain in the calf, have I been doing any extra exercise that may be a cause for that? So rather than simply leaping to the immediate conclusion, which is understandable, but may be wrong, that here we have a problem, it's thinking about, hang on a minute, let, 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 let's think of other explanations for what may be going on that may be much more benign. Have I had these before? Have I had these sensations before? If so, maybe this there's not a problem. So it's trying to talk yourself down, to be blunt. The other, the next thing I've got in my list is kiss, which isn't you need to kiss, and certainly in COVID days, we're certainly not going around doing that sort of thing. But it's keep, keep it simple, stupid. There are simple things that we can do. And one of the things that goes along with anxiety is that people begin to um, breathe more rapidly, begin to get physiological arousal in response to that. And so one of the things, and that exacerbates the experience of pain. So one of the simple things that we can do is just to start what I call deep breathing. 
And deep breathing is really, really simple. One of my physio, uh, no, not physio, occupational therapy. You don't get a, a look in here, Rick. It's a, one of my occupational therapy friends talked about counting the square. And all it was was that you would count the square. Breathe in, two, three, four, along the top. Hold, two, three, four, down the side. Breathe out, two, three, four, on the bottom. And then hold, two, three, four. It's a very simple means of sort of slowing breathing down um, uh, and um, sort of bringing that physiological arousal uh, 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 down. So if you're doing that positive, what I would call positive self-talk or rational self-talk, giving an explanation that isn't necessarily, this is really bad, doing the nice deep breathing. And then if you want to get a little bit more technical, there are things like mindfulness, which I can talk about um, if people are interested, which is in a sense, learning to become aware of the wider experience that people are experiencing at that time not worrying about the future, not worrying about the past, the pain, all those worries are there, but they're not a focus. They're not something that is the focus of our attention. And that, that widening of the attention to much broader things around us, you know, what is around us? How are we feeling? What is our breathing? What is our level of uh, tension, relaxation, et cetera, uh, may be very useful, may be very helpful. But of course, you know, you should allow yourself, if these things don't work, then maybe we need to call for help. But I would argue that at times like this, five minutes delay while you do these emergency self-help stuff before you even think about calling for help should be a good strategy to think about and employ. You may tell me I'm wrong, but um, we've done this with quite a few people and it works very well. If you're talking about long-term nagging pain, um, Stephen talked about the pain of an ulcer, for example, or pain in the calves that is um, just annoying, but you're not worried that it's an acute event, it's just a pain that's there. Um, then there's a whole variety of uh, strategies that people can, pardon me, talk about. And some of these I've already spoken about already. So the breathing, very helpful. Um, distraction, you know, if you think about what you're trying to do is to stop that focus on the pain because the focus is, is what's opening that gate. If you want to close the gate, then it's doing things that take you away from that. So um, distracting activities, things like things that engage you, a crossword puzzle, I don't know, I've got baking biscuits, that wouldn't stop me thinking about my pain, but it may stop other people talking with your partner about anything but the pain. And, and just to give you an idea about that, these distracting activities really should be done literally to distract yourself. I know that sounds obvious, but one of the simple things is that um, people talk about, oh, I read a book to distract. And um, if you say, are you distracted? They'll say, well, no, because I've, I've read five pages of the book, can't remember a word that I read but I've actually, because I've still been focusing. So in that case, the attention needs to be more direct. Maybe you don't read the normal way. You read word for word for word, rather than sort of a flow of paragraphs and, and, and so forth. So some of these things you might have to work at to break through um, the, those intrusive worries. And the earlier you do this in the pain, and every time you get, oh my God, what's going on? This is really annoying you start doing these sorts of activities, the better. Long hot shower, well, that's self-hypnosis. There's some really interesting work done in the pain management field, looking at um, self-hypnosis. And self-hypnosis sounds a very grand thing. And I, I'm not sure I actually believe in hypnosis in some ways, but what, what people do is some nice sort of deep relaxation, really getting themselves relaxed, and then using visual imagery to imagine themselves in some sort of other scenario um, by, a, by a, I don't know, by your favorite holiday place, by um, some sort of cool mountain stream or whatever, something that you find enjoyable, engageable, and it's just immersing yourself in, in that sort of imagination, and that can be very useful. And at the end of this, I'm not gonna talk you through it because I'm 
you know, time will be up. But I, I've, I've got a simple hypnosis strategy that people can follow. And uh, pain modification in, in, imagery, again, that's sort of using that imagery to sort of challenge and beat the pain. You imagine a block of ice, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So two vignettes, two ideas how to do it. They're simple. They have to be simple. If they're complicated, they won't work. Um, but um, these are um, some stuff I like to tap myself. So we've called it the good stuff. But these are um, leaflets available. You can download them from the, the website. And although they talk about distraction, meditation, panic, a lot of these are also relevant to managing pain. In fact, if you're aware of some of the stuff on panic, that model of pain I gave um, in that acute what's going on here is pretty close um, to a model of panic, um, although it differs in a couple of important ways. So there, over to you, Sean. Thank you very much. And, okay, uh, many sure thanks, Paul. This. And I'm glad you qualified in a COVID environment what KISS means. Um, <laughs> it, it, certainly, and thanks for that really, really helpful presentation. I've just got one question to pose to you, Paul, just before I hand back to Stephen uh, for the second half of his presentation. And that's about if you actually try all those simple interventions, you know, in terms of dealing with when your mind's playing tricks on you, the distraction techniques, the relaxation techniques, all those sort of things, and you're still struggling, could you sign posters to the type of, I guess, uh, expertise that might be needed to take you to the next level to help you deal with that pain? Yeah. I mean, first of all, I would say that these things take practice. So, you know, if you try it for a couple of days and it doesn't work, don't give up because these things take time. They're, they are skills. And like any skill, the more you practice, the better at it you get. Um, yeah. Where then to go? I mean, ideally, what you'd be looking to try and do is access psychologists through the NHS. And the pathways to that are interesting. Um, there are some uh, thrombosis services now that have psychologists or people that do psychological work that are actually linked now to the service. I know Liverpool, Kings in London and so forth, and I'm sure there are others. I think, Rigitza, have you got a psych psychologist working with you? Not if you have? Uh, unfortunately not oh. in the area, so uh, no, but we should have. Yeah. Oh dear, dear, dear. Okay, sorry about that. Um, otherwise, go to GPs. GPs are the portal of access to any sorts of secondary therapies, um, and they should be able to refer you. The other thing, if you have a bit of money to spare, is there are lots of private practitioners. Now, you need to be a little bit careful um, when you are looking at those, because there's a lot of people that, were, that are called counsellors, um, that do very good jobs, but not, I don't think, relevant to this sort of um, issue. So I'd be looking for people that will be probably called cognitive behavior therapy practitioners of some sort, because these are the guys that are teaching skills, teaching, teaching people to manage them. I think counselors tend to be sort of dealing with life problems, thinking it through, supporting people. So CBT practitioners, or go to uh, GP, try and use that as a portal to access services. Okay, thanks, Paul. That's it's great to know that there's a, I guess there's a whole raft of solutions and resources available and expertise beyond those really helpful measures you, you mentioned. Uh, thanks very much indeed, Paul. Um, I'm delighted now to hand back uh, to Mr. Stephen Black to take us through the second half of the presentation. And just to give you a sort of time check, we'll be aiming to finish at about uh, 10 past quarter past 11 um, if our speakers are still in a position to pick up on some of the questions that are flowing through for the q &A. So it's my pleasure to hand back to Mr. Stephen Black. Unmute. I always fail to do that properly despite countless Zoom conferences. It's a traditional thing. Thank you, Paul. That was a fascinating talk, actually, and I think hugely helpful because pain is is undoubtedly one of the aspects that we struggle to manage uh, and oftentimes find that even successful operations don't address all the issues of pain it's it's a, it's a very complex um, uh, thing so you know uh, this chap Peter Neglin is the person who taught me 
uh, and was really a mentor for me in getting to treat patients with DVT. And I was an arterial surgeon who had for years, like most vascular surgeons, I guess, not paid much attention to people with DVT because we didn't think we could do anything. And I met this chap. And this is a quote that really I take from him uh, that he has obviously paraphrased Shakespeare, but it's really uh, helps to understand where we are. Even is can that... I comment and say your slides aren't open? Sorry, your slides aren't open. Uh, okay, sorry. It said sharing screen. Let me end this here. Uh, right. Um, I'll do this again. I should be much better at this by now. I apologize. I, I shall sing a song at this point, Stephen. Yeah, can you see them now? Uh, not quite. Let me reshare my screen then. Yeah. Great, that's excellent. Thank you. And thanks, Joe. Yeah. So as I was saying, um, this chap, Peter Neglin, in the bottom of the picture, this is a quote that he uh, gave me, which is obviously stolen from Shakespeare and paraphrased, but uh, it, it really sums up what we're trying to do and achieve now in, in treating venous patients is to stop this post-thrombotic syndrome and pain. And, and much of the focus on that is, uh, as we said before, we're stopping blood clot in the first place. But if you do get it, trying to get rid of that blood clot as early as possible. And there's no doubt that we get much better results if we treat patients acutely within the first two weeks of getting a blood clot. So some of this is actually, you do have a little bit of time in treating blood clots. So if you think you've got symptoms, it doesn't matter if you get to us in 24, 48 hours, we can still do things for up to a week or two weeks. And sometimes that's part of the treatment is to try and see if, if things settle down. And part of this has been the focus in the past from everybody treating blood clot was on VT recurrence. So preventing recurrence of thromboembolism and presenting preventing pulmonary embolus, which is absolutely appropriate. But the issue of restoration of function or trying to get veins back to normal was not part of this. And if you think that veins are capacitance vessels, that are big pipes that are, are supposed to get bigger and smaller to accommodate blood flow, if they don't get back to normal, you're going to end up having ongoing problems because that pipe just doesn't work. So imagine your garden hose being turned on with somebody always standing on it with their foot or putting a kink in that garden hose. You might get some water out and it might be fine at a trickle, but when you turn the tap right on, it doesn't really work. And that's part of the problem with why pain comes on at exercise because you start to build up pressure in, in the legs. And, and we do know that there are some other subtle things that contribute to pain because some of the collateral pathways, for example, run through the spine and run adjacent to nerves. So they start to compress on nerves and press on other things that can start to cause pain. And you can imagine that when you see a leg that starts off like this with a acute DVT, that it's very hard to imagine how if you don't remove that blood clot, you're going to end up with a leg that's normal. And that's where a lot of the randomized trials that have been conducted were looking at. So A-tract is the biggest one. And we are really, the problem we face is that medicine is largely driven by trials showing data. And A-tract randomized 650 patients to getting treatment for immediately or being managed with medication alone. And the final outcome of the study was that the rates of post-thrombotic syndrome were the same in both groups. So the trial was considered negative for uh, DVT treatment. Um, but if you look more closely at the data, and this won't mean much to any of you, but this is the, the scores that we used to measure how bad post-thrombotic syndrome was. At every single time point in the study, the group that had treatment was symptomatically much, much better than the group who did not. But the way the trial was set up, the overall result didn't show a big difference in the rates of post-thrombotic syndrome, but people who had post-thrombotic syndrome tended to be mild rather than moderate or severe. And in my experience, that's a significant benefit for patients. So this trial is a classic example of studies being set up by clinicians where the outcomes that are most relevant for patients are not the outcomes that have been dri driving the endpoint of a study. And this is where we run into trouble in getting things funded and treated. And we need to get much, much better at focusing outcomes on patients. And actually, another study looked at these outcomes at five years compared to two years. And as the trial went on and you followed up people for longer, the benefit became more and more apparent because we know that post-thrombotic syndrome can take some time to develop. So after your blood clot, your leg can get worse many, many years later uh, compared to if you take a, a time stop, 
time shot one year off the original blood clot, you may be missing people who've gone on to get worse over time. The biggest downfall of all these studies has been bleeding complications of treatments. And that's one of the things that we find with all treatments is that it's no good measuring a treatment if you don't measure treatment done well. So that is one of the problems we always have with medicine is that, is that there is variability in how people do it. And we can see that in, in both these major studies, because they had to use lots of centers doing it, the actual success of the treatment was only between 50 and 60%. So it's not surprising that the outcomes were therefore roughly the same because half the group didn't really have successful treatment delivered. And that's one of the keys. If you're going to do something, do it properly. And, and one of the fallacious things about drug therapy in many ways is it's much easier to do. If you give somebody a tablet to take, provided the patients take them, which is a whole nother story about, um, about treatment, uh, actually the outcomes are reasonably predictable. So we have a lot of new devices now to try and get blood clot out. And it's been interesting for me in the last three years, we've seen an explosion of interest in, in DVT devices to try and clear clot from the blood system. Uh, these are three of them uh, that have come out. This device, VTEX, um, I did the first in human use of this device in a, in a really lovely lady who called herself Dolly the Sheep uh, because she was undergoing what she thought to be a first in man treatment, which was interesting. But she really had an extensive blood clot and then had this after having a big operation, which normally would preclude us from doing anything because the risk of blood thinners would be too high. But with this particular device, it has a basket that you can pull the, the, the clot out without having to use blood thinners. And that meant we could safely do a treatment and she's done really, really well. So there are lots of new things that are coming out now that make a difference. This is the list of devices that you may have. Here's a, a, us in theater performing a, a DVT removal uh, treatment on a patient. Uh, this is uh, a, a colleague of mine, Emma Wilton, who's now set up a DVT practice in Oxford. She's a consultant there. So for those of you who are in the Oxford region, you should ask to see Emma, she's, a, she's amazing. Uh, she actually had a DVT herself, so she's got personal engagement in treating patients with DVT, which uh, is an amazing thing. Um, this is another patient of mine uh, who had a DVT after he had a, a coronary angiogram procedure. And you can see the difference between his vein before and after the clot was removed. So it's no surprise that a leg doesn't drain if you block the pipe completely. And if you block the cup, sorry, block the pipe completely, you're obviously going to get problems from that. So our ambition is to try and restore veins to normal. Many of you will have heard of May Therner or Cockett syndrome, and there's a lot of talk about May Therner syndrome, which is, which is complicated. What that really is, is that your normal anatomy in your left leg, the veins have to cross behind the arteries to go back to the heart. And at the point where the, the iliac vein draining your left leg crosses, you get compression by the overriding artery, which is called May Therner syndrome, sometimes called Cockett syndrome. It's in Thomas's hospital, I'm supposed to call it Cockett syndrome because it was also described by a chap called Cockett in the 50s at the same time as May and Therner, who were Austrians, uh, described the syndrome. But in fact, it was recognized by Verco uh, many years before and uh, others at the same time that, that this compression may contribute to DVT. We've also got a lot of new stents, which we've ever heard about, and stents are quite scary things, but really what these are is just metal tubes that help keep the vein open when it's been damaged by scar tissue. And again, the list of companies that are now putting money into stenting um, is really, really high. And what that tells you is, is, is now a much, much more enthusiasm for driving treatments forward. So while industry involvement can be both a good and a bad thing, industry treatments can drive over-treatment, they can drive inappropriate treatment. What it means is that there is now money pouring into treating DVT patients, which does start to change the opportunities that we have. And even in the last uh, three years, uh, five years, we've seen a massive growth in, in the options that we have as clinicians for, for doing things that are better for our patients. So who should we treat? Well, really the focus is on people who have extensive iliofemoral thrombosis. That means blood clot that goes from your ankle all the way to your belly button at the very least. Because these are the groups of patients who get at the highest risk of getting post-thrombotic syndrome and are at the biggest risk of developing complications in the long term. So that the risk of blood clotting drugs is worth it to offset that risk of getting post-thrombotic syndrome in the long run. I'm very selective in patients who only have DVT confirmed, confined to their thigh because a lot of that blood clot will clear and your risk of PTS goes right down 
And so that balance of risk versus benefit changes. I've treated a couple of uh, patients who were international rugby players who had fire only DVT. And, and the reason there was because their risk for them was also uh, that they couldn't get back to the international career if they had any damage to their veins. And so we were much more aggressive. So sometimes it's about you as an individual patient. If you are an active sports person who wants to get back to sport, you may have a different risk threshold than somebody who doesn't. So half the thing is about medicine is it's not supposed to be paternalistic. It's supposed to be a conversation with a patient to determine what's best for them. If you just have clot confined to your calf vein or you have superficial vein thrombosis, then the chance of that causing you long-term problems is really very, very low. And in your case, then blood thinners alone are absolutely the right thing to do. So it's all a balance of bleeding risk. And bleeding risk goes up as you get older. Uh, over the age of 65, your chance of having a, a major bleeding complication from either the blood thinners or the, or the blood clot busting drugs that we give patients goes right up. So you start to have a risk of stroke from the treatment, and we have to balance that in those conversations. And really, the aim is to prevent post-thrombotic syndrome. So you have to try and target treatments of patients who get it. So we have those patients in the acute phase. And of course, we also offer treatment to patients who do develop post-thrombotic syndrome in the long run. And the things that really determine outcome for us are, are what we're going to get things right, or technical things. So that's how good your surgeon is or how well they do the operation. Uh, sometimes the stents themselves can break. So there are technical things about the devices that may not work. There's your clotting system. Do you have antiphospholipid syndrome? Do you have Betches disease? Do you take your anticoagulation? And remarkably, in studies of patients who should be taking blood thinners, patients probably only take them 50% of the time. Uh, hopefully that gets better with some of the newer drugs which are easier to take, but this really does impact on outcome. And then flow, which we saw in Virco's tried in the talk I did earlier on, is the, the single biggest thing that makes it difficult for us to treat. So I'll get some patients where they have such bad scarring in their veins that we can try with a stent, but we can't always keep it open. Uh, so sometimes that's a conversation to have at the start is what are the chances of success? If you have normal vessels up to your groin and you have a scarred vessel, for example, above that from the groin to the belly button, then your chance of a successful outcome is probably 90 to 100%. If you have scarring in your groin and scarring in your thigh, then the chance of success drops down to about 70% with the risk of having to have multiple operations to make that work. So there really is quite a big, um, a big trade-off before between all of these things. It's not always a simple decision about what can happen, but you know, oftentimes our job is to provide you with options and then you choose whether that's appealing to you or not. Uh, part of the problem with risk always, of course, is that it doesn't matter if it doesn't happen to you. So a risk of 10% of a bad complication is really 100% if it happens to you and 0% to everybody else. And that's part of the problem with uh, risk and getting to grips with risk in, in surgery, which is a difficult thing. At the moment, we're running another big trial, which I'm running with some colleagues in the States to understand how we can get better at treating patients. Uh, we call that clear DVT study. And we've also introduced this thing about walking because one of the, the things we found with our patients is they got really bad problems with cramping in their leg after treatment uh, or pain or inability to exercise, which wasn't part of any of the assessments included in the previous trials. The trials didn't look at whether they could exercise again afterwards, which was, which was really surprising. And we tried to work with this group called ICHOM, which is an international consortium for healthcare outcome measurements. And ICHOM, uh, really are an independent group that are based around developing patient-centered outcome measures. So what we have to be better at as clinicians is driving outcomes that are specific for patients and not specific for uh, what we as clinicians like, which is pretty pictures at the end of treatment to show that we've done a good job. And that comes back to you know an outcome for somebody like Dan Rob Robson, who got a, a blood clot uh, when he was playing after playing a match for England. And he presented with what uh, the medical team there thought was just a, a calf muscle strain to start off with, um, is that he really needed to get back to playing international sport. So his outcome was totally different for somebody who might be uh, uh, wanting to just uh, you know, go for a walk in, 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 the, in the park. He needed to play at a really high level. So the impact of clot on his lungs or in his leg would have been totally different to uh, this lady here who is trying a different level of exercise, not to say one is more or less important, but it's just a, a different conversation. And, you know, this quote was, was when I first started treating DVT was uh, given to me by a friend because I faced 
and still face quite a considerable amount of opposition from the medical fraternity because doctors are very slow to adjust to the potential for new things and, and don't like being proved wrong. And a lot of patients talk about doctors not wanting to send them on or not wanting to send them to another person. In many respects, we have to be conservative as physicians because bad things can happen to patients and the adage is first do no harm. But it does quite take quite a long time to get new treatments accepted by the medical community. And one of the things that has helped me is the team of people we have. Many of you know, will know Beverly Hunt. Uh, Karen Green is one of my hematology colleagues. Andy Cohen is an amazing resource for, for hematological knowledge. We have great nursing team, interventional radiologists, ultrasound scanning technicians. This is Prakash Taho, is one of my vascular surgical consultant colleagues. You know, without this team of people, none of this would be achievable. And that gives us confidence in making the right decisions for patients. We have lots of opinions if we bounce things off. Uh, if we get the blood thinning stuff right, Beverly, Karen, and uh, really help to manage the medical side of things. You can't do this sort of treatment without a team. And we do, in fact, have a psychologist as part of uh, our team that some of our patients get to. We don't have enough resource in that. And I think that's one thing we really need to address more because my feeling is DVT is a, is a holistic problem. It's not just about the physical problems. It's about that fear that comes, that anxiety that comes from, is this going to happen to me again? How do I control this? Because oftentimes this came out of the blue and nobody had any control over what happened to them. Uh, these are some of the results we've got from acute DVT treatment using different devices and the types of patients we got. Funnily enough, uh, the majority of the population we treat are women. So there, there is really um, a, a, pro a preponderance of that. It's normally left-sided. Um, but the ultimate thing that comes back to me is, is, is you have to get better at this. We all have to work together to get better at treating things. Uh, we have to get better as clinicians in, in, in choosing the right patients and giving the right message and engaging people on that journey to health. Uh, we don't always win. And, and I think personally, when I speak of the biggest challenge I face as a clinician is having started this, we get so many patients now that it, it becomes really, really difficult to give individual people the attention they deserve, which is why we need more people treating this so that, that patients and doctors will get that symbiotic relationship that leads to good health to me it's a it's it's a multifactorial thing that medicine has never never just been a science and uh, if we're going to get patients better we have to do all of it right so what are the conclusions of this well i think medical management alone does not treat or prevent post-thrombotic syndrome we know that so at the moment a 50 percent rate of post-thrombotic syndrome after developing a blood clot is probably not acceptable in this modern era and we need to get better at treating it so we do have some dedicated sense and devices to remove blood clot. Note they're called thrombectomy devices, not clotectomy devices, because uh, we're removing thrombus, as we said at the, uh, at the start. Uh, but we are on the first generation of design. So hopefully things will get better. And for some patients, that's a good message because there might not be an option now. But if you wait, and oftentimes people are young anyway, so you might be 40 with a blood clot. By the time you get to 50, there is a strong chance that we would have made big progress in this. So an answer of there might not be anything today doesn't mean that that stays the same for the future. So it's about working on all the things you can work on while we get better at doing this. But we do need long-term data. And the long-term data is, is helps us to make sure we do the right thing for our patients. It helps us to lobby Parliament and uh, the NHS and healthcare providers to pay for these things because they won't pay for it unless we can prove that there's a cost-effective outcome, that there's economic benefit, which I think is going to be un unarguable in the long run. But we have to get data together. This is a, a multifaceted approach to make sure that these treatments are available to everybody and we get things like physiotherapy paid for and other things that are, are, are obstacles to success in treating patients. Uh, so that's what I have to say. I think we can move on to questions. Thank you yeah. very much. Can I say Great, thanks for that excellent presentation, very comprehensive and um, I'm left with this feeling of, of optimism in the sense that there's a lot of research going on behind the scenes, a lot of new treatments and I, I love what you are saying about the, the patient focus and the patient outcomes um, and that's, that's a tremendous, tremendously reassuring. Can I ask uh, the panellists, have you got five more minutes, is this going to work for you? Oh. Stephen, are you okay? Yes, yes. Sure, are we okay for another five minutes? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, I, the, the, there's a lot of uh, questions that are linked to specific situations that people are facing, and it's beyond the scope of today's session to, to go into that in any great depth. 
and give an answer that would be fit for your circumstances because obviously your doctors have your own medical notes and situations but I just want to pick up on two questions finally and this one uh, seems to be a reoccurring theme across the board and it, I guess it's directed about um, patients access to physio and uh, we had a, a question posed about um, should, uh, somebody saw the expertise of a a physiotherapist but was told by the GP there's no funding for that resource and I'm just wondering uh, Regista, if you could give us a flavour on how patients can access and, um, and I know I realise that you'd have to have a global view to, to give a comprehensive answer but can you give us a sense of what to happen what, what steps patients should take if they're having difficulty accessing physio services? Yes I think um, the issue is with specialist physios in this area, and I think it's, it's, a, uh, it's an area that will grow. We'll hopefully see more uh, specialists in this. Um, so if you went to your GP, I would have thought you could access physiotherapy, but it's just a question of whether it's, it's um, somebody who has specialised in this, specialist knowledge in this, um, but otherwise... I would have thought that the route may be to go back to the consultant in the hospital or the specialist nurses there and ask, you know, how do, how do I access it there? That I think that might be, um, because, you know, it, it is possible that, that then one could access uh, physiotherapy, specialized physiotherapy through there, but at least also raising it as an issue will help raise awareness that this is this is required, this is needed. Thanks very much indeed. I guess one final question, and um, it's, I guess, I'd like the same thing, look at it from a variety of angles. And so the patients went through all these different options, but they're left with a life with uh, chronic um, swelling and discomfort. Have you any suggestions on how that individual, that person can actually, I guess, have a decent quality of life? in terms of living with that swollen discomfort? Um, I, I, I could take some of that. I think, I think the problem with swelling is different to the issue of pain. And we often find that, that patients have pain and swelling as a presenting feature. And interestingly, uh, the data we have at the moment supports these treatments being better for redu reducing pain than they are for reducing swelling. And some of that has to do with long-standing swelling starts to overwhelm the lymphatic system, which is a different system that drains fluid from your leg. So if you can deal with some of the causes of high pressure in the veins, it does help to make the swelling easier to manage. And a lot of the stuff with swelling is, is working out ways when it's worse, how you're going to manage your leg, augmenting things with um, stockings, for example, which do help, but you have to get properly fitted stockings. There's no point in stockings up to your thigh, up to your knee is about as good as you need. Uh, there's no added benefit for going to the thigh and that's, those are often more uncomfortable to wear and tend to form a tourniquet around the leg and roll down. Right. So wearing stockings, you can get devices that pump your calf on the internet that you can wear at night. They're a bit like the hospital pumps that you get when you come into hospital that, that squeeze your calf. Those make quite a big difference. Exercise is really helpful, particularly getting your calf muscle pump which is using your ankle and that's physio is coming to, to quite a lot of benefits. Sometimes patients have problems with their calf muscles and they don't activate the pump. And then keeping good moisturizer on your skin because a lot of the things like itching and, and, and damage to the skin come from the skin which is swollen, drying out. So really using moisturizer. And one of the, the, the things to do with moisturizer is a bit like putting suntan cream on. You really have to lather it on. You can't just put a little bit on. So I often will, one of the tricks that a nurse taught me was put moisturizer cream on and then wrap your leg in cling film and leave it on for an hour or so. It's almost like basting your leg in, in the moisturizer just to get it to really penetrate in and get, get your skin feeling less irritated and less angry. Um, so there are, there are things, but the reality is that if you're struggling with swelling uh, and, and you can't fix it, then it's, it's, it's often a really difficult debilitating issue that, that is, is using some of the techniques that Paul spoke about to kind of manage your, your just mental health around it, which is, which is really difficult. Uh, you know, and that's where people often feel that, that doctors will say it's in your head. And, and it's, not, that's not, it's a bad phrase, isn't it? That It's just, you know, you're just imagining it. It's, you know, pain is a really real symptom. And, and one of the problems we have, and Paul can mention this, is 
you know, spinal surgery has shown that a lot of times you correct the underlying physical deficit, but once you become conditioned to that pain, you have to use all these other techniques to overcome the pain that are unrelated in many ways to the physical thing that may have stimulated in the first place. Okay, thanks very much indeed, Stephen. Uh, Paul Regista, any sort of final take home messages from your perspective linked to that, that bill as well? Paul? It's, it's such an issue that, uh, you know, one hesitates to sort of give bland, sort of try this, try that. Um, but I think, uh, as with many people with chronic conditions I, that are somehow preventing them engaging in, in, in what they'd like to do, whether it's because of physical limitations. You know, I, I met some... Um, uh, a patient that was concerned about her appearance because she had a very badly swollen leg and didn't want to to be seen with that. And I, I think it is really a matter of identifying where you want to put your efforts, so that you know what are what are the what what do you value, and then taking baby steps towards some of those things. You know, if if you identify where your priorities are. And, and then um, maybe some small steps towards achieving those priorities. So, and not being disheartened if you can't do them all um, and not do them all quickly, but in a sense to have that feeling of progression so that, you know, that the steps are big enough to make you feel you're um, progressing, but not so big that you feel, oh my God, I'm overwhelmed, I'm not making it, and then you become depressed and then, then you fall back. So, you know, it's really easy to give this advice to people when you're, when you're in this situation, it's more difficult to receive it. But I think it is stepping back, getting some of that goal setting and then looking at progressive steps to things that you value, that you want to do, and not putting effort perhaps into things that are, are less important to you as a person, so. Thank you, Paul. Thanks very much. Would you say any it, final comments? Yes, just to add that, I mean, there are, and that probably depends on where you live, that there are sometimes pain management programs or self-management programs available. But, um, but even if not, just remember to keep as active as you can manage. Everybody's different. So we're not trying to get a one size fits all. Keep us so active as you can manage. And remember that you become the specialist in your condition. You are the specialist in you. Nobody else knows you as well as you do. So, uh, so, so learn, dip your toe in the water and see what works for you. Yeah. Thank you so much. That's, that's a lovely way to end the webinar, isn't it, really, in the, the sense that hopefully some of the things that you've said, we've said today, especially recognising that you know your condition better than anybody else. And articulating that with the team that are there to support you can make a real difference in opening up new opportunities to, to resolve some of your concerns. In conclusion, I want just to say a massive thank you to Stephen, Regista, and also Paul, and also um, the team at Thrombosis UK, Joe, Joe Anna, Andy, and um, Claire. And there's a lot of work goes on behind the scenes to organize these events. And we've been thrilled by the response and the time that you've taken. Um, the recording will be available on uh, the site within a few hours, I'm led to believe. Um, but just to say, I hope you've found today's event helpful, uh, offer some hope and direction, and hopefully that your understanding now of pain and blood clots has been extended as a result of the time you've invested in uh, joining with us today. So a massive thank you to all, and I hope everybody has a good day, whatever you're up to.